Good morning. Welcome to Stand on the Word. Thanks for joining me. Okay, uh, very quickly before I get into today's reading, I mentioned this, but we have a new digital platform, an app called Stand Firm, and you can actually read, get the Bible reading, get the video, the daily devotional, uh, and other resources. You create groups. There are Bible study uh, groups, Bible reading groups. There are prayer groups. It's, a, it's a, an exciting new app for your smartphone. And it's designed to prepare for if and when platforms like the web or Facebook or other platforms are taken from us. We'll be prepared to continue to be able to speak truth and communicate with one another. And so go to the App Store and download Stand Firm. All right, we are in chapters 3 and 4 today in 2 Samuel, verse 27 of chapter 3. Now, when Abner had returned to Hebron, Joab took him aside in the gate to speak with him privately, and there stabbed him in the stomach so that he died for the blood of Azahel, his brother. Okay, so we're now going to be going into this period of time where David is over Judah, and uh, this seven-year period that takes place, there's now, we're moving into a transition. Okay, so let's look at verse 1 of chapter 3. Now there was a long war between the house of Saul and the house of David. About seven, seven and a half years. But David grew stronger and stronger, and the house of Saul grew weaker and weaker. Now, just a note here, okay? The fulfillment of God's promises to you, to us, to each of us, it's often a journey. It's not immediate. David's journey to the throne over all of Israel took 14 to 15 years, from the time that Samuel anointed him until he was anointed king over all of Israel. So, you know, often our focus is on the destination, when the journey is just as important. The journey is not only preparation, but it also provides opportunities for us to see God working in our lives in, in small but significant ways. And, and I believe, I do believe this, that God wants us to enjoy the journey just as much as the destination. And while our destination is heaven, this, this earth is not our home, as we're on this journey as, as pilgrims, it's, as it has been described, we should enjoy it. I believe God wants us to enjoy the journey as we see Him at work in our lives, fulfilling those promises, but it is a journey. And so maybe God has promised you, maybe you're praying for something, it's not going to happen. It doesn't happen overnight. It takes time. It's a journey. Uh, one step at a time. So then we see that David, uh, in this passage, David is focused, I, would, I guess I would describe this as on domestic affairs, uh, his own domestic affairs, having a number of wives and children. And by the way, this is, not, this is not according to God's design, and it becomes a problem for David. Anytime we step outside of God's design for something, problems occur. And, and where we'll see this recorded in Scripture, uh, that this was a major problem for David uh, was with his children. Right? That's where we're going to see it. David may have been king of the nation, but he was not the father that God has called men to be to their children that they bring into this world. You know, there is overwhelming research today that makes it abundantly clear that children need a father to be both present, physically present, but also emotionally involved in their lives. It's essential to the well-being of our children. Now keep this in mind, when we get uh, 40 years down the road to Solomon's reign, the, the, the polygamous relationships that David embraced, Solomon celebrated. 700 wives and 300 concubines. You know, what one generation embraces, the next will celebrate. You know, so anyway, speaking of concubines, verse 6, Now it was so, while there was war between the house of Saul and the house of David, that Abner was strengthening his hold on the house of Saul. So we saw this last time. See, I think, I think Abner was a very um, aggressive man who had an agenda. That's just the way I see him. And, and he was using Saul's son, Ishbosheth, um, to, to basically be his lever of control and power. So in Saul, verse 7, and Saul had a concubine whose name was Rizpah, the daughter of Aya. So Ishbosheth said to Abner, why have you gone into my father's concubine? Now, this was uh, considered to be a, a move toward the throne. If you took uh, one of the king's harem, you know, one of the members of the harem, uh, a, a concubine, and had intercourse with her, 
then it was a, a, seen as a treasonous move to try to uh, take the throne. All right, so that's one of the reasons that uh, Ishbosheth is so worked up here. Then Abner became very angry at the words of Ishbosheth and said, Am I a dog's head that belongs to Judah? Today I show loyalty to the house of Saul, your father, to his brothers and to his friends, and have not delivered you into the hand of David, and you charge me today with a fault concerning this woman? He said, Look, I've, I've, you would be here if it weren't for me. Basically, what he's saying. May God do so to Abner, and more so if I do not do for David as the Lord has sworn to him to transfer the kingdom from the house of Saul and set up the throne of David over Israel and over Judah from Dan to Beersheba. And he could not answer Abner another word because he feared him. He knew. He knew that he wouldn't be there if it were not for Abner. So Abner then sends word to David. He follows through with what he said. David says he'll meet with him. But first, there's a precondition. He had to send Michael, David's wife, whom Saul had given to another man. So Abner takes her from her husband and sends her. Now, this was uh, probably motivated uh, by politics, I, I think in a large part, as this would strengthen David's claim to Saul's throne, which frankly was not necessary because God was the one that was elevating David. And we'll see later that this does not work out well for anyone, including David. 20, verse 20, So Abner and 20 men with him came to David at Hebron. And David made a feast for Abner and for the men who were with him. Then Abner said to David, I will arise and go and gather all Israel to my Lord the king, that they may make a covenant with you, and that you may reign over all that your heart desires. So David sent Abner away, and he went in peace. So Abner meets with David. And a deal is struck to consolidate all Israel behind David as king. But at that moment, verse 22, the servants of David and Joab came from a raid and brought much spoil with them. But Abner was not with David in Hebron, for he had sent him away and he had gone in peace. When Joab, now Joab was the commander of David's army, and all the troops that were with him had come, they told Joab, saying, Abner, the son of Ner, had... Uh, came to the king, and he sent him away, and he has gone in peace. Then Joab came to the king and said, What have you done? Look, Abner came to you. Why is it that you sent him away and that he is already gone? Surely you realize that Abner, the son of Ner, came to deceive you, to know you're going out and you're coming in, and to know all that you're doing. So Joab thinks, you know, this was a, he says, claims it was a spy operation. He was just coming in to kind of spy out what you were doing so that he would have more information to take back um, and plan potentially a, a raid. I also think there's a little bit more here. I think Joab uh, felt threatened by Abner as well. I mean, I think you're going to see, I think you see um, both of them very ambitious men. Anyway, let me go on uh, to verse 26. And when Joab had gone from David's presence, he sent messengers after Abner who brought him back to the wall, to, from the well of Syrah, but David did not know it. Verse 27, Now when Abner had returned to Hebron, Joab took him aside in the gate to speak with him privately, and there stabbed him in the stomach so that he died for the blood of Azahel his brother. Afterward, when David heard it, he said, My kingdom and I are guiltless before the Lord forever of the blood of Abner the son of Ner. Now, just a couple of interesting aspects here <clears throat> is that Hebron was one of the six cities of refuge. Now, a city of ref refuge was where a person who unintentionally killed someone could flee per for protection from the avenger of blood. That is the next of kin that was bound to, to kill the person who killed their relative. Now, Joab was wrongfully avenging the blood of his brother, Azahel, because he was actually killed by Abner in battle. We read about that before. But just kind of, again, another interesting aspect of this, Joab st stopped Abner at the gate and turned him aside and killed him. So he didn't actually make it into the city of refuge, where under the charge that Joab had made against him, it would not be accurate. But he killed him at the gate, turning him aside. So few observations on this. David 
immediately distanced himself from the actions of Joab and pronounced a curse on him and his family. But, but, this is, is something we're going to see, uh, a weakness in David's leadership. He did not take action. Now, he previously, he did. Remember when um, he addressed criminal behavior, like when the, the, the uh, uh, Malachite came and said that Saul was dead, that he killed him. Uh, he, he immediately acted against him. Um, we're going to see in the he, 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 here that he also um, acted in the next chapter with uh, Ishbethesh when when he was killed, uh, murdered. That he took action against uh, him. Um, in fact, though, if you look at this, his failure to take action. Um, in this case, may have been kind of what led to the death of Ishbath, Ishbasheth, uh, by by not addressing this injustice and this uh, this murder. Now, over time, Joab only becomes more of a problem for David, and so you, you kind of ask why why did David lack the fortitude to confront Joab? I, I don't know. It's possible that because Joab was his nephew, he felt constrained. Uh, not to create issues in the family. I don't know. But Joab was a problem for him. So Abner stood at the gate of refuge, as I mentioned, uh, a few steps forward. He would have been safe from the charge that Joab accused Abner of. And it, I think a spiritual parallel there is how many people stand at the threshold of salvation. They're looking right across the line into the gate. Uh, they, they know it's a place of, of refuge, which Jesus Christ, that's what a, a city of refuge represents. It's a, it's a place of refuge, but they become distracted or they are turned aside and they die in their sins, never crossing into that place of refuge in Jesus Christ. Verse 33, and the king sang a lament over Abner and said, should Abner die as a fool dies? Your hands were not bound nor your feet put in fetters as a man falls before wicked men, so you fell. Then all the people wept over him. He acknowledged that Joab was a wicked man. Father, thank you for your word. And Lord, I pray that as we, as we read through these accounts, Lord, not only of history, but Lord, in detailing the nature of man. And Lord, we see the weaknesses. It's so easy for us to see weaknesses in others. May we examine ourselves that, Lord, we would come in complete and total alignment to your word walking in obedience to you, and living it out in such a way that brings honor and glory to you. We thank you for the Holy Spirit, who is our teacher. And Lord, I, I pray that our hearts would be receptive to what the Spirit is speak, speaking to us and teaching us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thanks so much for uh, joining me. By the way, coming up uh, this weekend is our monthly Stand on the Word Bible study in, uh, in Baton Rouge. If you're in the Baton Rouge area, you can join us at our Faith and Freedom Chapel. If you'd like uh, more information on how you can do that, it'll be on uh, it'll be 6.30 on Saturday night. So if you'd like to join us, just email me, tony at tonyperkins.com. Until next time, keep standing on the Word. <laughs>